I urge you to join with us in prayer that God will anoint the minds of those making the decisions that we could get back to having church once more, be able to gather together, be able to fellowship together, spend time together. I never realized how much I missed just that fellowship and that the time, especially that we spend down at camp and different events until you can't do it anymore. And then you realize exactly what you had and the things that we took for granted. And when they're taken away, then you realize it. We can turn in our Bibles this morning to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. We're going to begin reading there at verse number 1. It says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given us. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we shall also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Lord, I thank you, Jesus, for this day, for this opportunity, O oh God. I ask, Lord, that you would move in this place, that you would move in the hearts and the minds of all those that are hearing today, O oh Lord. We ask, God, for your special anointing and your touch today, God. We give you all praise, all glory, and all honor in Jesus' name. God bless you all. I want to speak to you for just a little while this morning on this topic. From an enemy to an opportunity. From an enemy to an opportunity. For many of us, our time before Jesus Christ, before he came into our lives, we would have been considered an enemy of God. I know the definition of an enemy is this. A person who is actively opposed or hostile to someone or something. We may not have considered ourselves to be actively opposed or hostile to God. I know I certainly didn't. I didn't think that I would have considered myself to be God's enemy before God came into my life. I maybe just, I didn't necessarily believe what people believed. I, People would come to me and they would maybe want to share something about God and I wasn't interested in hearing it. I would might have laughed at them if they thought that if they told me that, that years down the road I was going to be in church, but I didn't actually consider myself to be what this says, someone opposed or hostile to someone or something. But you see, we walked after our flesh. We did things that we wanted to do. We were not submitted to anyone or anything. Again, I know for myself, I can only speak about myself because I'm the one that I know. I know that I was not submitted to anyone. I did what I want. I went where I want. I thought the things that I wanted to think. I spoke what came, what first thing that would come to my mouth. It was no submission to any higher authority. I might have been submitted to in some aspects to my parents. As my life got older and I had moved out of their home, I might have still submitted to some of their ways and things that they requested of me, but I wasn't no longer even under their authority anymore. I was my own man making my own decisions, doing what I wanted to do. 
I most certainly was not submitted to the word of God or to what God want, might have wanted in my life. Romans chapter 8 and verse number 6 says, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Verse 7 stated the carnal mind is enmity against God. Enmity is the, has the same meaning as enemy. It is the state or feeling of being actively opposed or hostile to someone or something. Here it says it is the state or feeling. Not that your actions or whatever, but you're in that state where you were opposed to God. So by taking that, it says the carnal mind is enmity against God. It says the carnal mind is when you are in that state when you are opposed to the things of God. Because you're not following what he's asked you to do. Even though you may not consciously be opposed to God, when you allow yourself to be carnally minded, you are opposing God. Because God wants us to walk after the spirit and not after our flesh. There's things that we do in our life that definitely test whether we're going to walk after our spirit or walk after our flesh. A message I listened to uh, just a little while ago my brother Josh Herring talked about fasting. He said that's one of the things in our lives that we, that we can do that really tests that relationship between the flesh and the spirit because our carnal body, our carnal mind, the, our thoughts and what we desire as people is to be fed. We want food. We know that we need food to live. So therefore, when you fast, you're going against what your carnal mind wants and you're subjecting yourself to the spirit and the will of God. Hopefully, if you're praying and you're, and you're seeking God and reading God's word during that time. It draws you closer by that because you're putting that carnal mind under subjection. So by this reasoning that we've looked at this morning, when it says in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned, it means that each and every one of us were or are enemies of God, depending on where you are in your relationship with him. I look at that, now I can look back at my life, and I can say, and I can know with an assurity that my life before God, I was his enemy. The Bible tells me so. That's what I liked about what we read in, in Romans chapter 5. It says in verse 10, For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were his enemy, he died for us. When we didn't know him, he died for us. When we didn't even care about him, when maybe we were some that were actively against him, he died for them. He went on to, he said before that, that in verse number 17, sorry, verse number seven, says, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. God didn't care. Didn't, wasn't waiting for us to become good. But God would, died for us so that we could become good. God reached for us to make us into something that we were not before. God wanted to change us to give us opportunity. Ephesians 6 and 12 says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We don't war against God before we come to him physically, just like we don't war against our enemies now physically. 
There's a reason why the Bible tells us that we need to pray for our enemies. Pray for those that, that, that use you. Pray for those and care for those. Bless those that are against us. We don't go and we don't war against them. We don't go and we don't start cursing them. We don't go and we don't start trying to pick a fight with people because they don't believe what we believe. Jesus certainly did not do that with us. I know that myself and probably most of us here today that if God started coming to fight with us while we were his enemy, we would not have come to him. We would have battled against him. We would have warred against him. We would have done whatever it took to not become what he wanted us to become. But he loved us and he gave his life for us and that's what drew us unto him and that's what changed our lives. When we go out into the world and people are against what we're doing and, and people are against what we believe, we need to pray for them. We need to try to bless them. We try, need to try to reach for them through acts of love and not by going to combat with them because we're not going to be effective. We go from being God's enemy to being an opportunity, an opportunity to reach the lost. We go from an, to an opportunity to be able to, to win other souls. We go to that being that opportunity to be God's hands and his feet reaching into the world around us. So what did Jesus do when he began his earthly ministry? He went out and he called 12 individuals to be on his side, to walk with him, to learn from him their lives would be forever transformed. He made them from enemies to opportunities. Peter, Andrew, John, Matthew, all of these ordinary men, and that's all that they were. They were men just like you and I, ordinary, living their lives, doing what they wanted to do, be going home to their families at night after work, raising up children. They weren't special. They had no superpowers. They didn't have, they weren't uh, Bible scholars. They, they had nothing. Nothing that would set them apart from you and I. But God came along one day and, and God chose them and asked them to come and follow him. They would be for, transformed from carnally minded individuals into spiritual minded opportunities. Their lives would be turned around, changed forever because of his presence, because of his word, because of his touch. Psalms 40 and 2. Psalms chapter 40. And verse number two says, he brought me up also out of an horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. Changed. You see, each one of us, in living our lives, we were walking a path that we didn't know the end of. We didn't know where that path was leading, but God sees the beginning of our lives and he sees the end of our lives and he sees every moment in between. God knows what pitfalls are gonna come our way tomorrow. God knows what obstacles we're gonna face next week. God knows what things we're gonna encounter down the road in our lives. We could not see ahead where we were going. We could not see what was coming. We could not see what the outcome of every decision was that we were making along the way. But we were still making decisions. We were still living our lives. We were still doing what we wanted to do. But God reached down and he changed us. We don't know what each of these 12 men's lives were like before they met Jesus. We don't know anything about these men before Jesus encountered them. One thing that we do know about Peter and Andrew was that they were fishermen. The Bible tells us that that Jesus walking along the Sea of Galilee came along and saw Peter and Andrew casting their nets into the sea because they were fishermen. The Bible tells us that's who they were. The Bible does not tell us about what the quality of their life was like. The Bible doesn't tell us whether they were successful. Maybe they were just barely getting by. Maybe they were on the verge of giving up. Oh, we can't catch any fish anyway. We can't make a living doing what we're doing. Maybe something wrong was going wrong in their lives. Maybe because something was happening 
Maybe they weren't successful fishermen. Maybe their wives were thinking about leaving them. We don't know what was happening in their lives, but all we know is that Jesus came along and he called them on that day and they dropped their nets and they followed him. And they walked after Jesus and they were there to learn from Jesus and they were there to see the miracles that he worked and their lives would be forever changed. Changed from being an enemy to an opportunity. In our lifetime, how many alcoholics Drug addicts, how many depressed, how many suicidal has Jesus called? How many opportunities has he made by reaching into people's lives like this? I know for myself, he spoke to me. I know that for myself, he called me and he turned my life around. He changed me from where I was going to where I am today. He made me into an opportunity, my life into an opportunity. Every weekend I was on a bar stool. Now every weekend I'm on a church pew. Yeah. What once was my lifestyle was to go to the bar and every Friday, Saturday night, and sometimes even during the week became a lifestyle of being in church every Wednesday and every Sunday and every opportunity that I can, that I could be used for the will of God. That when somebody calls, they need me. I try to do my best to try to be there to help them. I try to be that light. I try to be that example. I try to be what it is that God is calling me to be. Not living my life anymore for myself, but living my life as an opportunity to, to get into somebody else's life, as an opportunity to help somebody else out, as an opportunity to make a difference in somebody else's life. Because once God gets a hold of you, it's no, your life is no longer your own. Now it's about reaching somebody else. It's about helping somebody else. It's about being the light of God to the world around us. It's weird because now, I can remember when I first came into the church that I would go on Sunday mornings and the pastor would ask, oh, are you guys coming back this afternoon? No, no, that's okay. Sunday mornings is fine. We'd, we would bring Nick down for Sunday school and, and we would sit in the adult class and we would sit and learn a little bit. And then a short while later, you know, I think we'll stay for the afternoon service today. We started coming for the Sunday afternoon as well. And, and the pastor says, oh, we have service on Wednesday nights. Would you guys like to come? <laughs> Once a week is good enough for me, thanks. That's, that's enough. That's all. You're, right. You're taking my whole Sunday as it is. That's, that's, I'm, I'm giving you what I'm giving you. And then one Sunday, pastor says, oh, you know, we're going to start a, start a series on Wednesday nights. You might be interested in it. It's about the end times. Oh, really? The end times. So oh, that, that sounds interesting. Yeah, y'all yeah, come for that. Suddenly we were there. Wednesdays. Sundays. I remember during prayer time, during we would leave when we did first start coming in the mornings. We would come for Sunday morning and and then we'd go for lunch somewhere or go home for lunch, whatever it was, and and pre-service prayer is at 1.30 and I would drag my feet through lunch so that we could show up at about 10.2, 5.2, because that's all I had in me to pray. Five minutes, 10 minutes, I didn't know what to pray about. I didn't know about talking to God. I didn't know what he could do in my life or what it was that he was capable of doing. I didn't want to be there for a half an hour just sitting there watching everybody else pray because I, I felt guilty by not praying. I thought I, I need to be praying, but I don't know what to pray about. And I can remember the first time the pastor said, New Year's Eve, we're going to do the prayer clock and we're going to get together and pray for an hour. Really, an hour? It's amazing what God does in your life. Amen. To now being prayer coordinator. To now being able to spend a half an hour in prayer and it just goes by like minutes. As God works on you, as God changes you, as God makes that opportunity inside you. God changed my life from an individual who was tempted to go and, and run drugs when given the opportunity. And that I can still remember that pull that it had upon me. I'm thinking, oh man, all that money I could make just for a weekend of driving. And now look where I am today. No part of that former lifestyle evident in my life today. 
Saul, who would become Paul, was an enemy to God. And he was an outright enemy to God. Persecuting Christians, sending them to prisons, watching them be murdered. And here was definitely one who went from an, op from an enemy to an opportunity. On that road to Damascus, as he was walking along, as he was going on his journey, and God stopped him. And God spoke to him and said, Saul, Saul, who is it, Lord? It's Jesus, the one you're persecuting. In a moment, a voice along a road changed his life forever. No longer would he be Saul. No longer would he be the one leading the group, persecuting the Christians. But he would become Paul, and he would become the one to write two-thirds of our New Testament Bible. He would be the one to become the apostle to the Gentiles. He would be the one to go out and reach those that others were not willing to go and reach for. He'd be willing to be imprisoned. He would be willing to be shipwrecked. He would be willing to take beatings upon his back, all for the name of Christ. All for the name of what God did in his life. His, his life was forever changed. He reached for the lights of those like you and I. Because before Jesus came, before Jesus opened the door to the Gentile world, we had no hope. We were lost. We were on the outside looking in. But now we have that opportunity to be on the inside, reaching for those on the outside. Psalms chapter 37 and verse number four. Psalms 37 and four says, delight thyself also in the Lord and he shall give thee the desires of thy heart. Now, I've heard it said that that scripture gets turned around a lot of times. When you first read that scripture, you think, oh, this is wonderful. I delight myself in the Lord. He's going to give me everything that I've ever wanted. Yeah. That's not what that means. It means delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. The desires of your heart that you once had are no longer going to be the desires of your heart. But God will put into you new desires, new hungers, new wants, new wishes, and he will give those to you. And because those desires are going to be real to you, and those are the desires that you're going to search after, and those are the desires of your heart that God is going to fulfill. When you go from saying, I'm going to live my life for me. I'm going to do the things that I want to do. Go the places that I want to go. Suddenly, God gets into your heart and God changes your life and God changes your course. And you start looking, and you start thinking, God, what do you want me to do? God, where do you want me to go? God, how do you want me to act? How do you, what do you, what do you have envisioned for my life, God? And as you look to that, and as you seek after that, and as you desire that with all of your heart, God does it, and he makes it come to pass. And he starts organizing things in your life and starts orchestrating things to make those things happen because he's given you those desires. Inside the life of every person lies an opportunity. An opportunity to be so much more than what you currently have. I've testified to this fact before, but I just feel it's important that what we give, the things that we, the things that we sow in our lives, the Bible tells us those are the things that we are going to reap. Now, this is not a message about tithes, offerings, or anything, because I, I believe that this principle applies to so many areas of our lives other than just money. But I know that when God, when God got into my heart, and God changed my heart to say, yes, I'm going to give, 
And when I began giving faithfully to God, not just if I made $110.50, I didn't just give God $10.05, rounded out, marked out to the penny, this is what I'm giving God. But when I made $120 and I gave God 15, and I just gave because it was right to give. And when things came along and said, oh, we, we need an offering for this. And I thought, oh, I don't have a lot to give, but I'm going to give what I can. And I would give extra. And I would give extra. And I would give extra. And God would turn around time and again, and he would bless us for it. And I remember working at Kiribu GM when I first came into the church, making $14 an hour. And God blessed me, and I moved to Mark 4. And I made more money. And then I started working at the mine, and that's when, it was just before I started working at the mine, was when God really impressed upon me that I needed to give. And give faithfully. And I started working at the mine as a clerk. Making a salaried wage, and six weeks after I started, the market fell out. Oh, what am I going to do now? My job's going to be gone. I'm going to have to go work back at Mark 4 again. I'm going to have to go find another job. What am I going to do, God? Well, Corey, we really like the work that you're doing, and uh, we think we'd like to give you a promotion. People are losing their jobs around me, and I get promoted. Further on down the road, my wife wants to do something different. Well, no, sorry, she wanted to do something different. That's why I went to the mine, but she wanted to go to a ladies' retreat. Booked the time off. Didn't book off the Saturday. She went to her boss and said, I need these days off. And then she looked at the schedule and they had her scheduled for the day she's coming back. She went to her boss and said, I can't work that day because we're going to be coming home from my holiday. They said, that's tough. You need to be here. She said, well, I'm telling you right now, I'm not going to be here. So, of course, she didn't go in for that day. A month later, she gets called in. She gets written up for that. And her boss says the words to her, maybe it's time you choose your faith or choose your job. Now, my wife came home and she told me those words. And I said, well, I guess we know what the choice is going to be, don't we? Yeah. Yeah, yes. She went in the next day, said, I'm telling you right now that I'm quitting. Now, that was a loss of income for our home. But we made a stand for what was right. right. Mm -hmm. Ladies' retreat was far more important than that job on that day. A month later, another opportunity arises at work. Corey, we think you'd be right for this position. We'd like to offer you a promotion. Oh, it's all me. <laughs> It was because of my skill set. It was because of my knowledge. It was because, no, never would I ever say that because I know that where I am today was not because of me. I did not have the schooling. I did not have the education. I did not have the skills to be where I am at today. But God blessed me along the way. God blessed me along my journey that I've now been there for 12 and a half years and I've moved up steadily since I started there. God has blessed my family since I started there from giving. And not I'm not talking about just giving in our, in our money, but I'm talking about giving in your time. When you give time to God, he gives back to you. When you give your life to God, he gives back to you. Whatever you sow, that shall you reap. God says, you were once an enemy of mine. You were once doing what you wanted to do, but you gave your life. You offered your life back. You came and you, you changed your mind and you're doing the things that I'm wanting you to do and I am going to bless you for it. I'm going to make your life into an opportunity, an opportunity for growth, an opportunity for change, an opportunity to reach into the hearts of others around you. And that's what God has done in my life. That's how God changed me and moved in me. John chapter 10 and verse 10. I was going to read just the second portion of this, but actually 
I think I want to read the whole thing. John chapter 10 and verse 10 says, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. More abundantly. That's an opportunity for you today. You can have that life more abundantly. I feel that one of the greatest feats that our enemy has ever made was to lull our church world into believing that they can follow after their own desires, that they can follow after that carnal mindset, that they can do what they want to do and still make heaven their home one day. I listen to our secular church world when they say, oh, just say the sinner's prayer. All you have to do is accept Jesus into your life, accept him as your Lord and Savior, and ho, ho, look at that. You're going to heaven. That's not what my Bible says. There are those that believe that, ho, oh, I've repented of my sins. I've been baptized in Jesus' name. I've received the Holy Ghost. Oh, wow, my road's paved from here. I'm going to heaven. I'm sorry, that's not in the Bible either. When you live your life doing what you want to do, when God says, Brother Holland, I want you to go do this. And I say, no, I don't want to do that today. and he keeps asking me to do something and I don't do it, my mind becomes carnal. I'm following after the carnal mind, not the spiritual mind. The scripture that we read in Romans chapter eight says, the carnal mind is death. How much more plain can it be? When you're doing what you wanna do and not following what God wants you to do leads to death. Our enemy, the enemy of our souls, Satan, he is the one who has lulled the church world into believing that you can do what you want to do and still make heaven your home. You look around at so many so-called Christians today that live their life exactly the way I used to live. They're on that bar stool. They're out doing the things that they want to do. But they go to church on Sunday, so they must be saved. I want to tell you that God has come today to make you into an opportunity. You have the chance to be an opportunity. How many people have felt that certain doors in your life have been closed due to one circumstance or another? It's easy to come up with excuses as to why we can't do things. Well, this is what happened to me during this time, this is things that have happened to me and this is why I can't do and why I can't. On my LinkedIn yesterday, I saw a little video clip that says, anytime you think that you can't do something or that life is too hard, look at this guy. And it was a man who was playing ping pong with no arms, holding the paddle in his mouth. And he was whooping the other guy. I can't move that fast as what he was moving with two arms. If I had a paddle in both hands, I probably I couldn't beat this guy. When we think that we've got it rough, remember that there's people out there that have done so much more than we've ever done, that have achieved such greatness out of sheer force of will. And how much more can we do when we have God on our side? When we have God orchestrating things in our lives, when we offer our life to him and say, God, I want to be used by you. I want to be available to you. I want to be used for your glory, for your kingdom, for your honor. And God reaches into our life and God changes us from where we're at and God moves in us and makes us what he wants us to be. There's so much more that we can attain. There's so much more that we can do in our lives when we offer it all to him. From that time, 
that Jesus died on the cross, the door to opportunity was opened in every person's life. John 15, 13 says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Verse 14 says, You are my friends. Oh, he doesn't stop there. If you do whatsoever I command you. I want that to sink in. Our definition today of friendship is how many people you have on Facebook. People get really upset when somebody unfollows them on social media. Well, what did I do? Did I do something to offend you? Did I say something wrong? Then what did I do? A lot of times the other person is just the fact that they've realized that they've got 500 friends on Facebook and they don't really know more than about 10 of them. And they've decided to clean it up. So they they unfollow a whole bunch of people and they suddenly now they've offended everybody because they're not their friend anymore. Well, we weren't friends to begin with. I knew your name, I knew your picture, I knew. I can see what you're doing in your life because you post every meal on, on your social media and you post every time you go to the washroom and you post every time you take your dog to the walk for a walk and you post every time you go to the grocery store. So I know what's going on in your life, but I don't know you. God's definition of a friend is not the same as our definition of a friend today. People think, oh, because I know who Jesus is, he's my friend. People think, oh, because I've heard that name before and, and I know what the Bible is, well, he must be my friend. Jesus' definition of a friend is somebody who he knows, that he has a relationship with. And he's very specific in this verse. He says, if you do Whatsoever I command you, you're my friend. We all know about Jonah. Jonah, I believe, was a friend of God's. God knew him. Jonah knew God. And when, when God came and spoke to Jonah and said, I, I want you to go to Nineveh, I want you to go preach to them. I want you to go tell them what they need to do. Jonah said, no. I don't want to do that. Don't want to go there. Don't want to preach to them. It's not going to make a difference. Whatever the thought was that his mind that led him to get on a ship and go the opposite direction. But God said, uh-uh, not so fast, Jonah. I'm not done with you yet. Jonah, you are my opportunity. Jonah, you are the one that I've called. You are the one that I've chosen. You are the one that I want to go and do this. That city is never going to be reached if you don't go. Because I choose you. God won out in the end. We know the story ship was becalmed. They wondered why, what was going on. Jonah started telling them, the crew and the captain, who he was and what he had done. And they thought, we don't want any part of you, Jonah. And they threw him overboard. Swallowed by a large fish, spit up on sea, or onto the land from the sea. What are you going to do now, Jonah? Huh. Well, I was cast overboard. I should have died. I've been given an opportunity here. Jonah went and did what God wanted him to do. And that city repented and was spared. It doesn't matter where you find yourself. You might be thinking today, well, I'm, I'm, I'm too old. I, I can't change my ways. There's too, there's too much water under the bridge. There's too much time has gone by. I've, I've done too much wrong that God is not going to be able to do anything in my life. But I want to share with you today that God can 
can do what he wants to do in your life no matter what season you find yourself in. We can turn on our Bibles to Matthew chapter 20. Jesus shares, us, shares a parable with us that tells us that it doesn't matter what time, what season that you're called. You can go from an enemy to an opportunity in an instant. Matthew chapter 20, starting at verse number one. It says, for the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is a householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right I will give you. And they went their way. And he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing idle, and saith unto them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? They say unto him, Because no man hath hired us. He saith unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. So when even was come, the Lord of the vineyard saith unto his steward, Call the laborers and give them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. And when they came that were hired about the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. But when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more, and they likewise received every man a penny. And when they had received it, they murmured against the good man of the house, saying, These last have brought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst not thou agree with me for a penny? Take that, is, that thine is, and go thy way. I will give unto this last, even as unto thee. For it is not lawful for me to do what I will with my own. Is thine eye evil because I am good? So the last shall be first, and the first last. For many be called, but few chosen. There are those that have toiled their entire lives living for God. There are those that from a child, God had called them, told them, you're going to be a preacher. You're going to be a Sunday school teacher. You're going to be a missionary. Whatever it is, they've gone and they've given their lives to it. They've offered all that they had for their entire lifetime because God called them. God chose them. And God used them. There are some like myself who this year will be 18 years. Seems like a long time. It seems like a big number, but a short time. I should put it that way. There are some that may not even be in the church yet today. But friend, a reward is the same. We all can make heaven our home. We all can be with Jesus for an eternity. It doesn't matter if you are 10 today or 100. The thing that does matter is that the events taking place in the world today tell us that time is growing short. Our time laboring in the vineyard is almost to a close, and it's going to be soon time to collect our wages. So if you were called in the morning, or if you were called in the ninth hour or the eleventh hour, the master is coming back soon. He's coming back to reward those that have offered faithful service. No matter what season, what time you find yourself in today, you have an opportunity to be an opportunity. 
You have a chance today that you can repent of your sin. You have a chance today that you can choose to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of those sins. You have the opportunity today to lift up your hands and offer your life to God, and he can fill you with the gift of the Holy Ghost. You have an opportunity today to say, God, I offer you my life. I give you my all. God, cleanse me from my carnal mind. Cleanse me from my, my thoughts. Cleanse me from what it was that I was doing before, Lord. Wash me. Make me clean. And I am yours, God. We have an opportunity today to go from being an enemy of God to being an opportunity. I'm going to ask Sister Wilson to come this morning and play some music. I urge you today in your home to find a place to pray. Say, God, what have I been doing in my life? From sinner to saint. God, have I been doing everything that I've been doing for you? Have you been my focus? Have you been my purpose? Have you been my direction? Or am I allowing my carnal mind to be in control? We read in Romans chapter eight, to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. I urge you today to take a few moments and let's pray. Say, God, speak to me. I wanna hear your voice, Lord, as you minister I want to hear your voice as you show me, God. Where do I stand, Lord? I want to be a laborer in your vineyard. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for your blessing, O Lord, for your hand, O Lord, for your power, Lord God. You are mighty, O Lord Jesus. Anoint our minds.